Thank you very much for, for being here today. Uh, my name is Brian Fishman. I'm a, I'm a counterterrorism research fellow here at the New America Foundation. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to, to have you all here today uh, to discuss what, what I think is a, is a critical issue for us, which is rules of engagement and some of the dynamics of conflict, conflict in Afghanistan and, and how we should be thinking about the way forward uh, for, for our presence in that country, both in terms of military issues, governance, the big policy questions. Um, but the one issue that I, I really want to highlight here and, and have you guys think about as we go forward, as Jake presents, is this notion, is this sort of epistemological question. Jake has used a lot of social science technique, techniques to develop this presentation that are relatively unfamiliar to me and I think will probably be new to many of you. Um, but I think what he's do done here is demonstrated that these very sophisticated econometrics techniques and, and statistical techniques uh, have a lot to offer us in terms of understanding some of these broader issues. And, and this is important for us as we go forward and ask some of the big questions uh, about our presence in a place like Afghanistan. So uh, let me just run through our panelists really quickly. First is Jake Shapiro, professor at, at Princeton. Uh, Jake was former Navy guy and has done some of the best work, uh, I think, on, on looking at population dynamics and public opinion in South Asia generally, a lot of with Christine Fair recently. Um, we've got Aaron Simpson, PhD from Harvard, um, worked at uh, Marine Corps Staff College, um, and has been an advisor to the ISAF's counterinsurgency Ad assistance and advisory team. She's headed back there in what, two weeks? Okay. Um, Sarah Holwinski is the executive director of CIVIC, um, which has done tremendous work advocating on behalf of victims, civilian victims of violent conflict. She's traveled all over the world and has really done a tremendous job, and she'll provide some perspective there. And then Brian Katulis is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Before that, worked on gov governance and development issues in the Middle East. Without further ado, I'll get out of the way. And Jake, take it from here. Thanks, Brian. Um, so, so what I want to do today is start by just providing a little bit of a frame uh, for our discussion. And this is obviously a highly topical issue. And the debate on rules of engagement in Afghanistan and the treatment of civilians there has largely been framed in terms of a trade-off. Killing civilians uh, may engender additional violence, makes enemies, but the rules of engagement required to avoid civil killing civilians uh, put US and ISAF forces at unnecessary risk by forcing them to withhold fire or eschew the use of air power or other weapons that might be useful. And the debate carried out in these terms based on this analysis is, uh, is, is based on a false premise. And so what we're finding when we, when we get in and look at the data and what I want to describe to you is that avoiding civilian casualties reduces the rate of attacks over uh, the long run. And so if you think about risk to soldiers over the course of a deployment, not over the course of one engagement, the way in which the debate has been framed is just seems fundamentally wrong. So uh, before we get to that, though, I just want to review some basic, um, some basic uh, data and information about insurgent violence and civilian casualties in Afghanistan. So this is a map of the 398 districts in Afghanistan. And the data here are from January 1, 2009 through March 2010. And what we're looking at here is for each district, we've color-coded it according to the kind of frequency of insurgent attacks. And these circles are showing you the per capita number of civilian killed over this period. And there are two things I really want you to take away from this. The first is that there are some areas, like up here in the east, where there are high levels of insurgent violence and very few civilian casualties. There are other places down here in the south, say in coast, where there are lots of civilian casualties, and relatively low levels of insurgent violence. And then there are areas like in the districts in Kandahar and Helmand here, where those two things seem to move together. And the big takeaway from here uh, is that, and we're going to see this repeatedly as I talk about this, is that civilian casualties and violence don't move together in the obvious ways we would expect them to if we're kind of buying the terms in which this debate has been framed. And what we're going to try and do is use some analytical techniques that Brian talked about to figure out, amidst all this kind of noise and non-obvious patterns, what's actually going on, what's the actual effect of civilian casualties. So what I'm going to talk about uh, today, I'm just going to take a little bit of time, describe for you the data that we're using on civilian casualties, 
talk about some basic patterns, and try and give you a reference for comparison between Afghanistan and Iraq, a way to kind of think about how bad is the problem in Afghanistan. And then I'll show you what we think the effects of civilian casualties are. All right. And I'll drop my water. Um, so let me talk here, uh, tell you a little bit about the data that we're using. So this is data from the Empirical Studies of Conflict Project. And what we're taking here as the thing we're trying to explain is the rate of attacks uh, on ISAF units. This is coming from the unclassified fields of ISAF Sydney database. And this collects data on incidents, where they happened, when they happened, and what kind of incident it was in a number of categories. Uh, the data on civilian casualties comes from ISAF civilian casualty tracking cell, which records about uh, 2,100 incidents in which civilians were killed. Uh, count, counting for 4,000 and some civilian casualties. And this is uh, injured and killed. So it's not, not just killed, which is why there's a discrepancy between this and what you'd see, say, in the UNAMA data, which is only civilians killed. And then we're going to control for a bunch of other stuff, uh, like population and things. And the idea there is if we want to study the intensity of violence, we really need to control for how many people are in a given area, right? Because violence is a social phenomenon. Uh, we're going to use similar information from Iraq. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about this much today, but we've run the same analysis on Iraq using data from uh, MNFI's SIGAC3 database, which again gives you the location, time, and nature of violent incidents, and uh, data on civilian casualties that we've worked with Iraq Body Count and NGO to uh, systematically improve so that we can geolocate about 3,300 of these incidents. And something that should jump out at you right away is just the difference in scale here. So Iraq, in the period our data cover, uh, is averaging about 10,000 uh, civilian deaths as a result of combat, leaving aside all the sectarian stuff per year, right? which is about three times higher than what we're seeing in Afghanistan. Okay? So how are civilians being killed in Afghanistan? Well, what these charts are showing you is they're just showing you the proportion of casualties that come from different sources for men and for women, and then insurgent cost and ISAF cost. And I want to highlight as you look at this a couple things. The first thing is that if you just look at the totals on the bottom of each plot, the insurgents in Afghanistan are killing about nine times as many civilians from January 2009 through March 2010 as ISAF forces are. And most of that is happening as collateral damage and IED attacks. So an IED is exploded on a coalition patrol or an ISAF patrol as it drives down the road. And some of the people also driving on the road are injured. Second thing to highlight here is that if you look at the ISAF casualties, the majority are coming in escalation of force incidents. Right? And so this is the case where there's a checkpoint set up and a driver coming up to the checkpoint doesn't observe the signals to stop, misinterprets them, doesn't understand them. And as a result, the people manning the checkpoint uh, engage and injure that person. Uh, as a proportion of ISAF casualties, airstrikes only about 16%, pretty small, which we found fairly striking given the prominence with which airstrikes have figured in the debate. So now these data come from the civilian casualty tracking cell. I want to mention quickly their process. So beginning in 2008, ISAF, uh, and this is, you know, this is based on our conversations with them. The, the official history may be a little bit uh, more specific, but my understanding is beginning in 2008, ISAF began a concerted effort to track civilian casualties. And what this effort entailed was basically uh, collecting a series of reports above and beyond the standard incident reports when a civilian casualty happens. And there's an organization within ISAF headquarters that takes a look at these reports and tries to come up with what, did we, what do we think we learned, what actually happened here. And so we've taken those data. And so when we're looking at these, this is kind of ISAF's best estimate of the cause and the consequences of these incidents. So um, how does this compare to Iraq? Uh, this is a bit hard to read. But what we've done here is we've taken for Afghanistan and Iraq. And in each panel, we're looking at insurgent attacks, civilians killed or injured by the coalition, and killed or injured by insurgents. And then just the average for, per 100,000 people in each two-week period in each district. And the, only, the main thing to take away here is that the rate of insurgent attacks, once you kind of account for the population, is about twice as high in Iraq as it is in Afghanistan. Um, so in Sunni districts in Iraq, right here, 
the violence is about three times as intense in terms of insurgent attacks as it is in the Pashtun areas of Afghanistan. So that's the first thing. The second thing here is that the risk to civilians from combat in Iraq is quite different than it was in Afghanistan. So coalition forces hurt or injured civilians in Iraq roughly the same with the same frequency per attack in Iraq and in Afghanistan, about one in every 40 attacks. Okay? In Afghanistan, insurgents kill roughly four times as many civilians per attack as the insurgents in Iraq did. So roughly one in every four attacks versus one in every 20 attacks in Iraq. So if we want to think about how careful are insurgents being as a measure of how much they're engaging with the government and with its allies, uh, the insurgents in Afghanistan are about five times uh, less careful about civilians than the insurgents in Iraq were. So let me show you this graphically uh, and take a look at how these break down by sectarian divisions. So this is, again, average civilian casualties scaled this time per one million residents. Again, in each district, which is the smallest kind of sensible level of uh, governance in these countries uh, on a t for a two-week period. And we're just going to look at the kind of sensible definite divisions, right? Pashtun, mixed, and, uh, and non-Pashtun in Afghanistan, and Sunni mixed, and uh, Shia or Kurdish in Iraq. So again, two things to highlight here. The first is that the risk to civilians from combat very much follows the intuitive pattern, right? It's highest in Sunni or Pashtun areas lower in mixed areas, and then uh, lowest in the areas of these countries that are, that are quite pacific. Uh, but the second thing is that the overall risk from insurgents, while it's similar in Afghanistan and Iraq, at least in the, the kind of Pashtun and Sunni areas, recall that in Iraq they're conducting about twice as many attacks. So in a, on a per attack basis, given how much they're fighting, the insurgents in Afghanistan are just uh, much less cautious about civilian life. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a rough feel for the patterns of violence against civilians. And so what we, wanted, what we might want to look at next is what's the effect of this violence against civilians on the conflict, on the insurgency itself. And the starting point for this analysis is going to be an understanding of the general trends over the period in which we're studying. So what we're looking at here is the trend in violence, in insurgent attacks in blue, right, this blue line here, and civilian casualties in red. And uh, I've put these in standardized units so that we can see how these trends track with each other very clearly. Right? And so over this period, insurgent attacks follow a very clear seasonal pattern, basically rising in summer of 2009, descending in the fall and winter, and into the spring of 2010. And if this extended out, you know, it would go back up. Um, if you look at those civilian casualties, and this is total civilian casualties, it's moving around a lot throughout this period, particularly the ones that are being caused by ISAF forces. So there's something that's not tracking closely with violence here in terms of civilian casualties. It's not the intuitive story we might expect. Um, so then we can break this down by some key Pashtun provinces. Right? And again, we're, gonna, we're looking at violence per capita on the left, and this is time uh, on the x-axis. And what you see as you look at these is that there's no obvious pattern, right? Um, there's no obvious pattern here, right? In coast, in the upper right, you have this intense series of civilian casualties in the first half of 2009 that doesn't then lead to an increase in insurgent violence, or is not followed by an increase in insurgent violence. And then in Zabul, down here in 2009, there's this spike in insurgent violence in early 2009 that's not matched in an obvious way by an increase in civilian casualties. Okay. Uh, so if we then replace Kabul with Helmand, it shows us something important to keep in mind about the scale of the conflict. Okay. So notice when, when we go between these two plots, as soon as we put in Helmand and we change the scale to accommodate Helmand, levels of violence everywhere else in the country look pretty low. So that's the first thing to notice here. The second thing, though, is that if you look at this plot for Helmand, there's this huge increase in violence, right? It's at least twice as high as any other province in Afghanistan on a per capita basis. There's no concomitant increase in civilian casualties. So the dynamics of conflict and the dynamics of combat in these areas 
is such that these two things just don't track together in the ways that we would generally expect from the way this is discussed in the media. All right, so now we want to know something about the effect of civilian casualties. So um, this is a bit challenging, and the reason is that the ways in which uh, military organizations treat civilians and accept risk to their own forces are a function of what they expect to happen in terms of levels of violence. So let's think about a Taliban commander who's got a choice. He can organize a bunch of men into a coordinated ambush to go after a, an ISAF patrol, or he can plan an IED. If he plants the IED and tries to set it off as the patrol drives by, there's a good chance he might hurt some civilians, but his own troops will be safer. Now, if that Taliban commander is lo feels like he's losing the population in that district and that they're starting to inform on him and share information with ISAF, he's more likely to choose the IED than he would be to choose the ambush that puts his forces at risk. So what this means is that the violence we observe against civilians is going to be a function in part of how people expect combat to be going. And so figuring out uh, trends is going to be very hard. Um, so what we wanted to try and do is we wanted to try and say, let's see if we can match geographical units, in this case districts, on the history of violence so that the motivation between units as far as the treatment of civilians going forward is the same. And then because that civilian casualties uh, trend has a big random component, remember we saw that was bouncing around, we're going to be able to look at the difference between districts in which civilians are killed and those that aren't. And the difference in future trends is going to be a function of the treatment of civilians by one side or the other. So what we're seeing here is we put all these district two-week periods on a relative time scale. And in time zero is when a civilian casualty event happens or doesn't happen. And then as you march out from that, what we've plotted is the difference on average due to one civilian casualty between places that had civilian casualties and places that didn't. And remember, we're comparing effectively places that had the same history of violence and so where things looked very similar. So for example, seven periods or 14 weeks after an event, right, a district that had one civilian casualty has about 0.13 more attacks per thousand people than a district that had zero civilian casualties. And so you see basically this long run trend that increases after ISAF caused casualties. And there's no similar coherent trend after insurgent casualties. Okay, so this is kind of the key takeaway is that you get this long sustained effect when ISAF causes civilian casualties. Now, um, we do a bunch of other analysis in the NBR working paper that, that, that where we analyze this, but I just want to run through a couple other effects, things. The first is that in Afghanistan, this effect is very localized. So it's only events that happen within one district. Okay? So if you take the casualties that occur in a district and then all the ones in surrounding districts, the ones in surrounding districts have no effect on subsequent violence within a district. So this tells you something about how this is affecting violence. It tells you that it's something about the local exposure to violence against civilians that's leading to increased violence. It's long-term effect. It plays out over many months. There's no reaction, as I showed you, against insurgents. And this is all consistent with the story that you see in some uh, press reporting that what this is really about is it's about uh, a cultural dynamic in Afghanistan which demands that when bad things happen to your family or those close to you, you take up arms against those who did it. And critically, the effects that we're seeing here that I showed you uh, in this plot, this effect is almost all being driven by Pashtun areas of the country. If you classify each of the districts of the country according to whether or not it's Pashtun, that's basically all coming from the Pashtun areas. Okay? Um, so uh, what did we find in Iraq? Well, we ran the exact same analysis in Iraq. And there, there again, it was localized, but it was very short term played out over one or two weeks. It was symmetric in the sense that when coalition forces in Iraq killed civilians, there was increased violence for a week. When insurgent forces in Iraq killed civilians, there was decreased violence for a week. And again, this is violence incidents to combat. And in Iraq, it was very sensitive to local politics. So the extent to which the coalition paid a price was much higher in Sunni areas than in mixed areas. And the opposite was true for insurgents. The insurgents paid almost no price in Sunni areas in Iraq but there was a strong decrease in violence after insurgent-caused attack 
civilian casualties in mixed areas. So let me give you a sense for the magnitude of all this. An average isaf caused event in Afghanistan led, led to two civilian casualties in the period we study. So avoiding two such events means one less attack over the next six weeks in an average-sized Afghan district. So let me try and put that in perspective. In Helmand, since January, there's been one insurgent attack, uh, one ISAF casualty for every six insurgent attacks. So if you, in Helmand, the calculus comes down to roughly avoiding 10 average-sized incidents equates to six less attacks, or about one less casualty. Now, uh, when we think about it this way, we can start to pin down some of the arguments about rules of engagement, because then we get into a more concrete question of how much do rules of engagement that avoid civilian casualties raise risk to ISAF forces? And that's very different and much more uh, knowable than this generalized discussion about are we putting forces at risk or not. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll end there and turn it over to, to my discussants. I think the other thing just to, to highlight from this analysis is that this toolkit which we tried to apply to this problem can help us refine the debate because it's not, uh, the question is no longer necessarily is there this trade-off and do civilian casualties harm or hurt? Clearly they uh, hurt the war effort in the sense that there's increased violence after civilian casualties. But we can then have a more concrete discussion about given current ROE, how much risk are soldiers absorbing and how much risk are civilians absorbing and is that an appropriate trade-off? But the, the, the either-or debate, I think, is, uh, is incorrect. All right, thank you, Jake. Um, so now we'll go to our discussants. Please sit down, guys. Uh, we're gonna, we'll go Aaron first and then Sarah. Aaron will talk about some of the, the implications here for counterinsurgency. Sarah can give us some perspective on uh, civilian casualties generally and, and I hope on, on some of this data because she's looked at this sort of data in the past and, and different data sets. And then Brian will give us uh, a bit more perspective on, on the governance issues in Afghanistan and some of the political debate here in Washington. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for, for coming. I hope we have a good discussion for you over the next uh, hour or so. And thanks to Jake for um, making graphs that are very intelligible, having seen the originals many months ago. I'm, I'm happy to have the new ones. Um, I wanted to make two kind of um, basic points before talking about counterinsurgency more, more broadly. Um, the first is actually about the, the airstrikes point, which we hear a lot about civilian casualties and, and airstrikes, which is very much uh, a legacy of what we affectionately call the Bomber McNeil era in Afghanistan, when General McNeil relied uh, very extensively on airstrikes, potentially or partially because uh, there were very few troops on the ground, uh, and this led to uh, a lot of indirect fires and, and air fires at, at the time. Um, General McNeil did not keep track of civilian casualties, and so a lot of the data from that period really isn't captured in that, um, you know, it occurs before 2009 when we start doing that. So that we, be, that we see now that, you know, airstrikes don't cause a lot of casualties is actually a response to some of the excesses of those previous periods. Uh, and I think now people will be really surprised how rare um, airstrike-induced civilian casualties occur. They're, um, I mean, they're noteworthy because they are, in fact, quite rare these days. Um, on a completely different note, um, I think that one of the most important things that comes out of this paper is the kinds of analysis you can do and the kinds of leverage you can give um, senior decision makers using very basic information but very advanced analytics. Um, we spend, typically in the military, they spend a lot of time on very sophisticated collection techniques uh, but then run relatively simple sort of analysis on them, rarely sort of doing much more than, than trend lines. Uh, I'm involved at a project at DARPA right now that's trying to do it's more similar to what Jake is doing, bringing together uh, computer science and social science and trying to get good data to, to work with. But the data that Jake's working with is very straightforward. It's counts of civilian casualties and counts of significant activities, both of which sort of are the, the most basic thing that gets reported up the chain um, in, in Afghanistan right now. And you can do extremely powerful things with a good social science background. You don't have to be even quite as technical as Jake to get really rich uh, conclusions um, 
out of that. Jake's done previous um, analysis on does SERP work, do SERP projects work, and how do they affect rates of violence. Um, ISAF has tried to answer questions like the relationship between partnered patrols and partnering between American and Afghan forces and the relationship between that and civilian casualties. And having seen some of that work, I can tell you that it's really important to have the good social science behind you when you're trying to take that basic data and have really informed conclusions because it's very easy to, uh, to do that badly and actually come to almost the exact wrong conclusion on some of those things. So I think that's uh, very commendable and one of the things I hope we're able to, to do more of as we, as we go forward. With regard to, to counterinsurgency, I think one of the things the paper makes um, a really good comparison of Iraq and Afghanistan. That's obviously not the, maybe the, the first point um, that, that one would highlight, but the, the difference in the, 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 viol the dynamics of violence in those two countries is, is really striking, both with regard to the overall pattern, um, but also with regard to civilian casualties. And I think, you know, we're just becoming, I think, starting to become aware of the lessons we did and did not learn for Iraq and how those are being applied in Afghanistan, which has some, you know, unique interpretation or unique, um, I don't know, not problems, but uh, applications, I suppose. One of them is that the, you know, our understanding of counterinsurgency uh, as, as revealed in our doctrine and, and as revealed in our practice is very much about how to fight an insurgency in Iraq. And as Jake mentioned, right, there's a strong sectarian component to that insurgency. That sectarian component is almost completely absent in Afghanistan. You just see nothing like we saw in, in Baghdad or, either, or even other cities uh, in, in Iraq in, say, 2006 and, and 2007. Um, when the American Army rediscovered counterinsurgency in, say, 2005, 2006, uh, it went back to a set of older texts by a guy named David Galula, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with now, Robert Thompson, who emphasized, right, this population-centric form of counterinsurgency, right? And that's what we talk about all the time now, right, population-centric coin. Well, Thompson and Galula talk about pop-centric coin in terms of controlling or separating the population. It's a very colonial administrative vision of, of counterinsurgency. Um, as we digested that or ingested that into our experience in Iraq, separating the population became protecting the population, right? What's, what's scarce in Iraq in 2005 and 2006, especially after the Samara Mosque bombing, is, is security, right? Um, we, in fact, kill relatively fewer civilians than, than the insurgents and certainly relatively fewer than you know, uh, sort of the militias that are that are engaged in sectarian violence. That migration from separating the population or controlling the population to protecting the population as the way of envisioning counterinsurgency, I think, has pretty profound implications. Um, I think David Petraeus was was able to um, kind of master that in a certain way in Iraq because he, you know wrote the songbook, right? He's the author of the Counterinsurgency Manual. Well, he's the titular author of the Counterinsurgency Manual. And um, there's probably several more of us out here in the galley that I can't see. Um, that, uh, you know, he's able to navigate that. Um, when General McChrystal tries to sing from the same songbook, I think he's less was less deft at it um, in that he could sing the song, but he hadn't written it himself. And that, that difference in background, that difference in um, orientation, I think makes a big difference in Afghanistan. Now we're going to get a great natural experiment because General Petraeus himself has obviously come, come back into theater. So we'll, we'll see how that, how that goes. But I think when we talk about we do a lot of protecting the population in Afghanistan, but it's not immediately clear always who we're protecting the population from. Uh, there aren't, there isn't a Mahdi army, there aren't Al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, there's very little Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, um, and so the, the perceived threat to civilian security um, starts with the Afghan National Police and then moves on to coalition forces. Um, and so it's not the same dynamics that drove the doctrine and drove the approach in Iraq, even though we're still using much the same doctrine and much the same approach. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there and let uh, Brian and Sarah pick up, and hopefully we'll come back and have a discussion a bit more in a bit. <coughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I am not a statistician, and I got really terrible grades in that, so I'm going to try to wow you with anecdotal evidence that I have seen in well, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, 
So let me just talk for a few, few brief minutes about why this data matters and how it can actually change rules of engagement. And a special shout out to Brian for asking me to address how we change the Taliban's behavior. I appreciate that softball question <laughs> coming to me. Um, I would make a lot of money in this town if I had an answer to that. Um, Nearly 10 years into this war, there are a lot of assumptions and statistics flying around us. Um, and one of my favorite assumptions goes a little something like this. Afghans believe blank. They believe X, Y, or Z. And most people are using that in this town to say we should stay in Afghanistan, we should go out of Afghanistan. The only thing that I can say is a legitimate, homogeneous, belief of the Afghan people is that they do not want more civilian casualties. They don't want any civilian casualties. And um, that might seem a very obvious thing, but I think it's something that we all need to take just as a baseline data point. Um, we read these headlines of 27 civilians killed, 15 civilians killed. They're thrown at us, and we're meant to put them in some sort of order, as if we have the context for that, as if we understand what one widow's life will be like after her husband, the breadwinner, is killed, and maybe perhaps what her 15-year-old son will do. Will he go to school or will he pick up an RPG and start firing at U.S. forces? Um, and that's just one example. I mean, look at, the, look at the WikiLeaks. I went through dozens of these documents this week and had no context. I couldn't explain what they meant. They were just, you know, significant acts thrown out there. There were escalation of force incidences. Where is the context? What does this mean? Um, and, and data really matters. The U.S. military in particular has this history of denying that it keeps civilian casualty data, and in fact until 2008 really didn't. And, and there are a lot of theories as to why that is. It may be because of the... Um, because of backlash, public backlash against the Vietnam era, keeping body counts of combatants as a way to measure success. Um, but here's one example of why keeping and analyzing this data is important, and I think Aaron touched on this a little bit in Iraq. General Corelli in 2005 mm -hmm. took a look at the data that was coming out of checkpoints. These are escalation of force incidences where a civilian would drive up to a checkpoint, a soldier had four to seven seconds to decide if that civilian was a threat or not, and then a chain of reactions goes into effect. Am I going to shoot? Am I not going to shoot? And he saw that there were an incredible number of civilian deaths at checkpoints. So he took the data, said, we're going to keep this data, first of all. We're going to take a look at it. We're going to analyze it. And then we're going to put in place new procedures. And immediately the civilian casualty rate dropped. That's the kind of thing that not only keeping data but analyzing data can do for our troops. And there are obviously strategic importance to that. Um, but as you know, the military is a big lumbering institution and that doesn't change on a dime. So when we went back into Afghanistan and focused our attention there, 2006, 2007, the civilian casualty rate at checkpoints skyrocketed again. Those lessons were not learned. The data wasn't being kept. The data wasn't being analyzed. And that's, that causing civilian deaths wouldn't win any friends was not paid attention to as a strategic importance. So last year we see the sea change. General McChrystal puts in place these tactical directives that limit airstrikes that require better identification of belligerents before you can shoot. These are, of course, the big things that everyone is, is all up in arms about now, um, so to speak. And the directives, they, they dropped civilian casualties caused by ISAF forces by about 40%. So if you take a look at this room, and I'm just going to, because I'm not very good at math, say that there are 100 people here. Um, you know, that's if, if we were all at risk of being killed or injured, that's 40 people who would be able to walk away. That's a really big deal in a small community, even in a big community. Um, so the data points that they're looking at over in Kabul now include things like Jake and his team study. The things that we need include things like the willingness of civilians to provide intelligence the willingness of civilians, and not just victims, but their neighbors, their friends, their village elders, et cetera, to participate in the government, serve in official positions, pay taxes, not engage in corruption, not take advantage of positions of power, 
that civilians may push families into poverty, lead others into criminality. We need that kind of data. That civilian casualties can delegitimize governments and militaries in a way that prevents all of those things from happening on governance, but also increases instability and vulnerability and enhances the power of insurgents. So the data points are no longer that 15 civilians are killed, but what do those 15 civilians killed mean for the community and the mission? And a final word on data. If I could ask Erin one thing to bring back <laughs> with her in two weeks, it would be scarves. The uh, scarves would yeah. be great. <laughs> yeah, um, loads of them. That the ISAF civilian casualty tracking cell is an incredibly important thing. This was created back in 2007. 2007, they were thinking about it. 2008, I think it was actually implemented. It's not very good yet. Um, so the data that they're collecting is incredibly important. It's not being analyzed properly or to, to much extent at all. And they're not capturing all of the incidences. So this really needs to be something where every single PRT and every single commander and every single person that comes into contact with a potential civilian casualty or even just an allegation needs to be reporting back to that ISAF civilian casualty tracking cell because of the things that this kind of data can do, including what Jake's team did. Um, so Brian also asked me to address the second thing that I'm going to address, which is working with the military on this kind of thing as a human rights advocate. Because aside from this strategic imperative that we're talking about for causing less civilian casualties, I would hope that everyone in this room would agree that there is a moral imperative, that causing less civilian casualties is the right thing to do. Um, because make no mistake, Afghans expect more from US and allied forces than they do from the Taliban and insurgents. They simply do, and every time I go to talk to the international forces, they complain about this, and I say, it's the reality. Use this as a baseline. You, you can't do anything about them expecting more from you, and in fact, they should expect more from you. Our rhetoric, they, they don't expect more just because of precise weapons and, and accurate targeting. They expect more because of our rhetoric, which talks about human rights, humanity, compassion, and respect for civilian life in war. That's also why Afghans expect more from US and allied troops. So use that as a baseline. And there are many in that big security apparatus over in Virginia and in Kabul that believe that they are clearly shared human rights values with people like me who advocate for civilians, for civilians in war. The thing about international forces I've found at an individual human level, just talking with soldiers, is that they want the very same things that Afghans and Iraqis want. They want to be safe and they want to go home. And so there's a lot that's shared there. Um, and if you think about what would happen if this study had come out differently? What if it had come out in the opposite way? What if there was no correlation between civilian deaths and, and attacks or soldiers' deaths? Would we accept that as a reason to not help civilian victims or make sure that there were not less deaths? Despite all of the publicity around these rules of engagement that pit soldiers' lives against civilian lives, which I think is a, is a, is a false construct anyway, despite that, um, most of the soldiers I talked to believe strongly in protecting and avoiding civilians, not only because of the strategic importance and because they think it makes them and their buddies safer, but because, and it sounds very quaint, but they see those children, you know, playing in the playground in Helmand as they could be their kids back home. They get this, you know, they're not robots, they're actually humans. Um, so as for the Taliban, um, they have shown some signs of recognizing their own interest in lessening civilian casualties. Last year, they put out a code of conduct, which was meant to say, we will try to reduce um, our impact on the civilian population. So that effort, whether it was a propaganda ploy or whether it was a really sincere desire to limit civilian casualties, failed absolutely miserably. If you look at the data in the months after that code of conduct, um, the civilian casualties caused by the Taliban skyrocketed. So obviously this code of conduct did absolutely nothing. Um, but I do think that the more progress international forces can make in reducing civilian casualties, and the more that progress is recognized as a good thing and as a positive thing by the Afghan population, the more pressure is then put on the Taliban in their particular communities, because it is all local in Afghanistan, to limit the suffering it causes. So, even movements like the Taliban are concerned about legitimacy. I mean, that's where that code of conduct, I think, comes from. 
Um, so the more that the U.S. and its allies can insist on the better treatment of civilians as a prerequisite for that legitimacy, um, I think the more pressure will be on non-state actors to shift their behavior. Um, and even if that pressure causes them to be, to shift from abject brutality to, you know, plain old brutality, then that's something, right? That's something. And that's something that we should be working toward. In Iraq, I fear it's a different story. Um, what motive do those violent actors have to limit civilian casualties? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's incredibly important, and that's why we need this kind of data and analysis. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to New America for inviting me here. Um, and it's really with great respect uh, with my co-panelists in this paper that Jake has done is phenomenal. It's solid. It's thought-provoking. It took me back to about a dozen years ago when I was in graduate school, and it made me brush off my econometrics notes. And for those of you who haven't taken econometrics, it's really not that fun. For those of you who have taken high school Spanish, uh, you might remember like I do, dos Coca-Colas, por favor, camarero. And I will tell you what you will remember from econometrics, and this is the key, because I'm going to weave it into uh, some of my remarks here, and then try to make actually a bit more broader point. Correlation does not necessarily mean causation. That's one fundamental you need to keep in mind when you look at these very, uh, I think, sophisticated models. And then two, and this is one probably I'll come back to a little bit more, omitted variable bias, trying to figure out what are actually the factors that impact uh, your dependent variable, your independent variable. And I say all of this because I think I understand everything Jake has presented here, and I think the argument is logically coherent. Local exposure to civilian casualties drives increased insurgent violence in the long run. It makes rag rational sense to me. W what I'm going to do today is probably perhaps be a bit of a respectful skunk at this picnic and raise some broader questions uh, because in, as I was reading the paper, it prompted some thinking about where we are in our national debate on national security on an Afghanistan and a worry that perhaps we've lost sight of what is the essential question of national security that my mentors have uh, drilled into me is, are we actually keeping Americans safe? Um, it's a question, ironically, when I uh, either go into agencies or go over to see my former colleagues at the White House or other things, we sometimes lose sight of. The, the, the central question of are, what we're doing uh, is keeping America's, uh, Americans safe. And today's national security debates, and, and, and Afghanistan in particular, I would say, and I, I felt this as I was reading the paper, have taken on a somewhat Alice in Wonderland uh, quality that we sometimes find ourselves down a rabbit hole uh, debating security conditions in a particular corner of Afghanistan and Iraq. And I don't, I don't say this glibly because I, I, I deeply, and I've been to these countries and have worked in them, I'm deeply concerned about it, but we've lost fight, sight of that fundamental uh, question. Are we keeping Americans safe? And, you know, and I say all of this with the appreciation that I'm probably about to get a lot of angry tweets and blogs um, from uh, counterinsurgency uh, colleagues. Don't blog anymore. <laughs> but counterinsurgency or coin, I am, when I look at it from that fundamental question, increasingly concerned. And the, the, the word actually raises a red flag for me when I look at where we are in Iraq and Afghanistan, a red flag in that unnecessary, excess, excessive, and actually wasteful spending when we circle back to the fundamental question of are we keeping Americans safe? And I, I say that, you know, I, I was talking about Iraq yesterday, and I think when one examines the drivers of conflict and violence in Iraq, and actually you do an in-depth exploration of what actually happened in the surge, which I don't think, and what happened before the surge and what were the main uh, drivers, I think there's a fair argument to be made here that the coin emperor actually may not have many clothes or at least should cover up a little bit um, when we talk about how and what actually can help uh, contribute to sustainability uh, and security equilibriums in certain countries. What our role is versus what are the other factors. So I want to make two points. One that um, Brian asked me to address, I'll, I'll do secondly. The first ties to this point I just made. Th this fundamental misunderstanding of the drivers of conflict in particular countries. And I would posit, and I think it was a healthy thing, I was engaged in this in 2005 to 2008 in coming up with alternatives on Iraq, there was a very healthy debate that uh, we have to admit are all caricatures. And there was a caricature of counterinsurgency versus counterterrorism last fall, 
Um, and, and as we see, you know, uh, from the reports in Kandahar and other places, that these, in a sense, are, are false choices. And when one actually can take the time beyond like a 30-second soundbite on a radio program or TV program to really try to explore this in depth, I think the, the, the notion of competing centers of power and uh, different conflicts within a country I think uh, is a more accurate describer of uh, counterinsurgents versus insurgents. And I, think, I, I say this understanding that the coin crowd gets this. They under, you know, I, I think it's – the main question I'm raising here is the analytical frame of uh, counterinsurgency versus insurgents and kind of lumping groups into broader categories and then abstracting from what are, I think, quite complicated – uh, conflicts over power in particular countries. And Aaron, Aaron is completely correct. It is, and, and Jake acknowledged this that in Afghanistan, it's much more disaggregated. It's harder for me to understand what happened. Um, my, this is kind of my simplistic talking point, but understand there's more depth beneath it. In Iraq, somebody lost, and they lost long before the surge forces of 2007 uh, appeared. And, and, you know, uh, we, I think, for a range of reasons, our analysis is clouded by our own self-involvement um, in certain issues. And, again, I say this with full respect for those who've served and uh, with all of the policies. I, I think when you look at what happened in 07 and in 08, the 10 to 15 percent increase in U.S. forces, but closer to 10 when you talk about the other foreign forces that are dropping out, the real surge that mattered was, was, was the surge of Iraqi forces. And this points to a certain confusion I sometimes find in the counterinsurgency literature of the outsiders versus those that were actually trying to support uh, inside in terms of a coherent government. But so I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding in using this framework. And I'm sorry for being kind of the skunk at the picnic for raising this, but I think I'm doing this in part to provoke uh, uh, what I, I hope will be an interesting debate. But some of the questions. Uh, some of the omitted variables uh, or some of the other factors besides civilian, civilian casualties caused by ISAF. I was just kind of popped into my brain. You know, new Taliban elements fresh from Pakistan uh, and the role that Pakistan plays uh, in all of this. Uh, a local leader settling a land dispute in favor of his nephew. Um, other factors that I don't, I'm not certain that the models actually take into account. And then this metric of overall stability. And I've talked to some of my friends who've served both in Iraq um, and Afghanistan. I was asking, what's the fundamental metric? And one of my friends, a lieutenant colonel, uh, recently to re retire, said, well, he thinks number of attacks on civilians, not necessarily on us, is, is the key thing. And the problem is a lot of those attacks go unreported. Um, so we've come up with other sort of metrics, which is number of stores open at night, numbers of a sharp, uh, shoppers in the market. Again, uh, rabbit hole, Alice in Wonderland, are we making Americans safe? And I think it's a fair question to ask. Um, another, you know, interesting thing I think would have been interesting to test is actually the presence of ISAF forces. And I don't know how you test this. How do you test the counterfactual? And maybe you measure just the presence of ISAF forces in particular areas. But if ISAF engages kinetically from a province or a set of districts, what does this actually do to, to that? And, and, and again, understand that I'm not like, just leave, but analytically, let's let's test this. Second point, and Brian wanted me to address this because we've done some work on this, and a couple of my colleagues, uh, you should take a look at Governance in Afghanistan by Caroline Wadhams and Colin Cookman, but I think talking about other factors, and people talk about this in counterinsurgency, is the uh, inability to provide governance and basic needs and local assistance. I think this is understood by the counterinsurgency framework, the strategy, the doctrine, and I think it's a key part of it. When you look at actually what we're doing uh, in Afghanistan right now, or, and we could talk about Iraq if you'd like, what we did in Iraq and, and the fact that Iraqis are still protesting uh, because of a lack of basic services or basic security in, in their areas, I, I, again, I think there's a question of what are the actual drivers of conflict. But um, in, in Afghanistan, we often hear that it's a lack of justice, a lack of effective governance. And I believe that to be the case. And I think... We've only, and this paper doesn't really, I think, address it unless I've missed it, but we've only just begun to try to figure out how do we, with our considerable resources as a nation, spending uh, hundreds of billions of dollars, how do we actually shape the calculations of not only just Karzai, and Karzai is just a code word for how do we actually shape the calculations of a range of leaders who are dealing with internal power dynamics, and if uh, Jake is correct, and I believe he, he is, that many of these dynamics are quite localized and decentralized. 
uh, how do we actually use considerable resources and get uh, the actors to actually share power in a sustainable equilibrium? Um, and I think, you know, counterinsurgency actually has some answers to this, and we're trying to apply force in certain areas, and I think it's an interesting model to, to look at, but the question is, is it sustainable? Is it sustainable on two accounts? Uh, one, I would say, in terms of power sharing, if you look at the government in Kabul, and I came back from a trip to Afghanistan last year where, where I observed these elections and came away with a real, um, and I think this is a serious point, of do, do we actually have partners? Um, and I think we do have partners, but the question is who, who are they and what are we actually trying to achieve in the long run? Uh, back to this Alice in Wonderland quality of like, if we can't articulate in the positive what it is the end state that we can conceivably um, uh, think of in Afghanistan when it comes to governance and institutions and how all of this hangs together and then sustains itself, if we're constantly framing things in the negative, which I understand why we do that, um, because we do need to pr protect American national security interests, it just begs the question of what are we actually doing? And if Karzai is unwilling to, to share power at the governance level. Development assistance, and I've see, I see some of our friends and colleagues here uh, from the development community, serious concerns about the billions of dollars that we're actually spending with the best of intentions uh, in Afghanistan right now. And um, this is not just about SERP versus other mechanisms and what gets there faster. It's about issues of absorptive capacity, local power structures, engendering certain dysfunctionalities perhaps that actually may drive the conflict much more than a, a, as awful as our civilian casualties may be. But these local, and I actually, my, my sense, and this is an instinct based on some time, I don't speak Pashto, but I speak Arabic, some time in Iraq and other places, my sense is that's, that's the deeper, more resonant challenge. I don't, I don't have data, I don't, have, I don't have to collect data on, on these local politics, but it's a huge factor and we're quite more knowledgeable, I think, eight and a half years into this, of the local dynamics. But circling back to my first point, are we preventing people from actually flying planes into our buildings? Um, uh, are we actually keeping Americans safe? And I, I think, you know, there's a strong argument to be made there. But it, it leaves me with, you know, not any easy answers or, or, or conclusions, except that some of the best arguments that you hear when some of my friends uh, in the administration or you see people testify on the Hill, some of the most strident arguments um, for continuing the current course are actually sunk costs and national pride and honor. That we're there because we're there, and somebody actually said this in one of the op-ed pages, and I, again, I'm saying this to try to provoke a debate, but I actually believe this to be an issue that we need to wrestle with as a society. That once we get down some of these rabbit holes, and I think it's, again, the exercise of examining the data and looking at this. But if we don't go back to that central question, are we actually keeping Americans safe? We're really running a risk of getting a national security strategy that is overall imbalanced and not really understanding what we do uh, when we actually spend a lot of money with the best of intentions and go into countries and operate with certain strategies. So I hope you, know, you take all of this with the, uh, the spirit in which it was delivered because I actually think uh, we're at a very difficult phase. And having this debate um, more broadly, uh, uh, not just about what impact our civilian casualties have, but what are the other variables that may be missing from the model, I think is a, is a key part of the debate. So thanks for making me part of it. Sure. Well, uh, thank you all. This was, uh, I think we have a lot to talk about. Um, we're going to go to Q&A. Uh, I think Jennifer is there. She's got a microphone. Um, when you ask a question, please stand up, identify yourself, speak into the microphone. Um, I'm going to ask uh, the, the first question that I, I think uh, melds together some of these epistemological issues that I'm interested in um, and that I think that we should need to be thinking about. Aaron made a great point about all of this data that we collect and we don't analyze, right? It takes somebody with sort of unique skills like Jake just used to analyze this data to pull some of these conclusions out. And I think oftentimes I, I really want to second that point that Aaron made about data and, and improving the ways that we analyze it. Um, but the question that I have that I was sort of scribbled down as we were thinking is here is that we're going into a series of policy decisions again. We, we had a policy decision-making process, but we're going to have a review in December and then again in July. And my question is, what do we need to know in order to make a good decision? Right? Rather than what, what is the good decision, let, let's leave that aside for a second, but what, what facts do we need to know in order to make a good decision. And I'm not sure that we've really sort of laid all of those out. Uh, you know, we, we're sort of past the point 
where it's easy to say where, where this decision is black and white. So what do we need? You know, we, we know we're in an area of gray. What do we need to know in order to make a good decision? Thoughts by anyone on the panel, and then we'll go to the audience. Or should you guys just mull on that one well, a little bit? Well, <laughs> I, I would, I mean, I, we've heard a little bit of it, and it's not the only factor, in, not to be Johnny OneNote here, but when Leon Panetta said there's 50 to 100 Al-Qaeda uh, representatives, and, and then there's another estimate of 300, less than 300 across the border in Pakistan, I really do think we need to, fr from the basic national security interest, and I, I don't think it's going to matter that much politically, to be frank. Um, um, unfortunately, I think most Americans, understandably, are fixated at home. But going back to the core interest, are, are we in, in balance, in, in, in a balance globally? I think there's a fair argument to be made about the threats to U.S. homeland um, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, which are very real. I'm not an ostrich here, which are very real, but measured against what, a, what other threats there are in other parts of the world. And that's a deep concern that I have. And when I say, you know, when I said earlier about counterinsurgency, um, and the way our fixation with it. I mean, I think when you look at things like Stuart Bowen's um, studies, I just read his latest study of the amounts of money that we've spent in an unaccountable fashion um, in, in certain places. And then you think about that broader question of are we actually safer? And, and you know, it's funny to hear somebody from the Center for American Progress to, to raise up Don Rumsfeld, but he asked an essential question that to this date nobody's answered. And we're coming up on the nine year. Uh, anniversary of 9-11. Are we capturing Killing Moore? And I, I think some people, like in the Special Operations Command and others, are looking at the resource balance. But what I'm suggesting here, and I'm suggesting this to somebody who back in 2005 said we needed to redeploy from Iraq to finish the job in Afghanistan, if that doesn't sound familiar, that we've, we've now actually tripled uh, the presence and we have uh, uh, we can measure the impact. It may be still early in this latest phase. We're, we're only halfway through this latest surge, and I think that's a fair argument. But the question shouldn't be just about the local population, which, again, I'm trying to prompt a debate, but it should come back to U.S. national security interests. And I think the thing that I would be interested to see is what are terrorist networks with a global reach, what are their capacities, and what territories are they explo exploiting, um, not only in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but in other places. I think I would love an answer to those questions that, that Brian raises. Um, unfortunately, all those answers come in the context of 100,000 troops in Afghanistan, right? So my selecting on the dependent variable training in social science tells me that, that that has its own problem, right? So there's only 50 to 100 al-Qaeda in, in Afghanistan right now. And you say, okay, well, what's, you know, why are we there then, right? There's, they're, they've, they've left, right? The job, the job is done. Well, they left because we're there, right? And there's a, there's a fundamental sort of uh, Schrodinger's cat problem, I think, associated with, with that. Um, I also realize what a coin gearhead you were as you were wanting to know the big, you know, national interest piece. I wanted to know how many district governors are sleeping in the district center at night. Right, that's what I want to know. If I could get that and actual Afghan on Afghan violence measures, I would I would have a much better sense. Um, maybe line ministries in the districts, but something because um, the point that Brian brings up about governance is absolutely the point. So the flip side of what's scarce in Iraq is security, and so we have to protect the population. Is that what's scarce in Afghanistan is governance? And so we have to find some way to provide governance, chiefly in the form of, of uh, conflict resolution and land dispute resolution, which is probably the biggest thing. Um, that's not something that external actors are, are good at doing. I wrote an entire dissertation about why it's a real pain in the ass to flight counterinsurgency in other people's countries. Um, it's not the preferred way of, of uh, addressing instability, right? Bringing in 100,000 foreign troops rarely improves stability in the short term. That's a, a real, genuine challenge. Um, I think the counterinsurgency community more, gen more broadly is, works, is trying to think about what that suite of responses is so that we can avoid exactly these kinds of you know, unsustainable, long-term, very expensive overseas commitments uh, while still maintaining the, the, the policy and military type response of, of being able to deal with instability in countries that were it to occur would provide both safe haven but also um, more direct challenges to, I think, American security. But I want to know about district governors. That's what I want to know about in December. And defining governance, right? I mean, so defining governance within that counterinsurgency policy. Can we have a counter an, an effective, successful counterinsurgency that also um, maybe keeps the Afghan traditional governance mm -hmm. system without changing it? And I think we haven't yet defined what governance um, we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. 
So I, w I want to respond to your question, Brian, by tying, trying to tie a couple of, of these issue to, issues together. So, you know, Brian asked, is what we're doing keeping Americans safe? Um, I think the appropriate question to ask is, uh, is what we're doing what we need to do to keep Americans safe? So let's take as a given that uh, pursuing al-Qaeda abroad and in Afghanistan is a key to preventing attacks. Um, then the question becomes, uh, is the current presence what you need to do to do that? Right? And we have a great data point for this, which is Pakistan, where by all accounts the U.S. is doing a fairly good job of pursuing transnational terrorist groups. And so the question then is, how are we doing that? And how are we getting the intelligence that's permitting the, the widespread use of drone strikes in Afghanistan? Now, if that's coming through an intelligence apparatus that requires substantial protection of informants by the Pakistani police and military, then the analogy to Afghanistan would suggest that you actually need a substantial central government and ISAF presence in these areas to operate the intelligence networks that you need to go after uh, the terrorist operatives. If, on the other hand, that targeting is occurring largely through technical collection capacity or through the use of informants that doesn't require substantial government presence, then that tells a very different story about what's required in Afghanistan to prevent the territory from being useful for al-Qaeda and other organizations. Um, and where, so this is where the kind of details of what's going on in Pakistan and how that's working tie into the answer that we should tell to the broader question that Brian's asking. Because if it turns out that you don't need a substantial presence to prevent the territory from being useful to terrorists, then the answer to Brian's question is what we're doing now may or may not be keeping Americans safe, but there's a much cheaper option for achieving the same end. Right? If it turns out that it requires a strong presence, then the answer may be what we're doing now is necessary. Okay, let's, let's go to the audience. Jennifer, right behind you. Hi, William Seymour, uh, International Peace Quest Institute. Um, I guess one of the things I found interesting was Afghanistan's, Afghani insurgents' willingness to cause civilian casualties, um, which since you mentioned the revenge effect, and maybe I didn't quite understand that correctly, but it seems like that would actually be the opposite thing they want to do, um, except for the fact that your data then showed that they didn't actually seem interested in taking revenge on the, on the Taliban, just, you know, if they happened to be, you know, the guy who killed their cousin happened to be an American or a, a European. Um, and I'm just wondering if, you know, why is there that, that lack of interest in, in, the Talib, in taking revenge on the Taliban or the other uh, insurgents? And if, um, as Sarah said, the number one thing we can be sure that Afghans want is an end to civilian casualties. Um, I guess, well, really, I mean, how do we get, like, why don't they kind of take that and make that their own sort of goal and take action towards it? And maybe how do we get them to take a proactive role in sort of opposing, um, trying to bring an end to the end of, to casualties? Thank you. Um, so, I think there are a couple possibilities for why you don't see a response against the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan, uh, as you did in Iraq. Um, one is that uh, it may be that uh, the Taliban are very effective at uh, intimidation and at preventing the formation of rival militias. So what was different in Iraq, uh, that one of the things that was very different in Iraq than in Afghanistan is the density of government forces in Iraq was much higher. And so it was the case that there were, there were really very few parts of Iraq where if someone called in information on the insurgents, there wasn't a, a unit ready to take action on it. So the cost for organizing to punish the insurgents for uh, activity against the, coalition, uh, against the government in Iraq was fairly low. Right? It was texting in some information to an anonymous tip line. Right? That's not the case in Afghanistan, where the density of government forces is much lower. And so what's required to take action against the insurgents there is actually like organizing some guys to go and fight. And so the problem was much more symmetrical, I think, in Iraq because of the density of government forces. And it's just a different, uh, the dynamics are different in Afghanistan. So I think, that, I think that's the most likely reason why you don't get a uh, symmetric response. I think one other reason is that um, if you remember from the charts that Jake put up, that the most of the civilian casualties caused by insurgents are from IEDs. 
Um, they're not from direct fire responses, right? So um, sort of anecdotally, right, Afghans blame the IEDs on us because there aren't IEDs unless we're there. So there's, there's the, the blame gets shifted in a very interesting sort of way. But I think you, you know, your question you know, catches on something that's exactly right, right? How do you shift that dynamic, not just so that they don't blame us, but that's so, you know, Afghan, um, whether, and in particular, Pashtun, which is the real trick, right? Um, ire is directed at the Taliban, vice, you know, Karzai or the coalition forces. Um, you know, from, from, from that perspective, that seems like a much harder hill to climb in, in some ways. Um, uh, Rajiv Chandrasekharan had a great piece this morning uh, in the Post where he talks about how in, in Iraq there was really uh, um, I mean, uh, the, the perception that there was a existential threat to both parties, right? The Shia were deathly afraid of a lot of the Sunni death squads. The Sunnis were de very much afraid of the, of the Shia militias, um, particularly in Baghdad, but also elsewhere. Um, and that created meant that they both needed a, a protector. There's no existential threat to the Pashtuns of southern Afghanistan, and it certainly doesn't come from the Taliban, who are, you know, uh, if not their biggest champions, at least their most effective advocates uh, in the in the current setup. So they see the Taliban as sort of wayward brothers, not um, you know, militants to be to be feared. Unfortunately for us. Yeah, and we also do have one example back in March of one example, which may proliferate, it may not of. Um, villagers actually kicking the Taliban mm -hmm. out of their village because they were so fed up with, basically they had had some civilian casualties, ISAF came in, paid compensation, the Taliban said, you will give me that compensation, and they said, absolutely not. And they got so fed up that they took up arms and they kicked them out. And so you've got a very diverse population in which some villages agree with the Taliban, some families within villages agree with the Taliban, some disagree but are busy surviving. Some disagree and will take up arms. Some disagree but are too intimidated. Some disagree but are upset that ISAF keeps bringing, you know, threats of IEDs into their villages, so it's incredibly diverse. But there are there are some places where where villagers do get fed up enough to kick them out. Okay. Yeah, right here. Hi, Jason Lemieux. I'm a research intern with CSIS. Uh, I'm wondering if the panel has read Austin Long's counterterrorism proposal, where he proposed that we basically go down to 13,000 rangers and special forces and black ops uh, in Afghanistan just to neutralize people who might try to crash planes into U.S. buildings. I'm wondering what the panel thinks about that perspective, both from a, a national security perspective here and also from a human rights perspective for the Afghans. Austin likes the rangers too much, but... <laughs> I mean, I think it's a serious proposal. Will it become like the mainstream option when we head into the review? And here I'm not I'm not an advocate, I'm just an analyst. It's no. I mean, when you look at what drives uh, national security debate, and um, it's not necessarily the best option for U.S. national security. It is, uh, if you if you want to be like a top-notch, your, your research analyst at CSIS, if you want to succeed in this town, you split the difference. Um, you, you actually... Which is why Austin's a professor in Columbia. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. But, but you actually split the difference and you find some sort of consensus point, which is necessary to do for a range of political and policy reasons. The problem is it actually, you know, there's a, if, if one takes a step back, it, it actually leads us down a certain path dependency and a certain approach where you're, you're then, if you take a step back and say, wait, does this actually make any sense, um, what we're doing right now? It's hard to, to, to question that conventional wisdom. And I know this, you know, as a fact for people who've gone in at senior levels of this administration, where it's really hard, even if you want to implement a certain change, there are certain bureaucratic imperatives that push you in certain directions. So I would say it's a serious option. I think it's hard to test what uh, the impact of it would be. And I think the disinclination, and it's a smart disinclination, to be risk averse, because there are certain amounts of risk um, related to that. But I, you know, and I would just say, again, uh, going back a little bit to making some reference to the, to the Iraq debate, the, the supreme irony of a lot of what, what we debated maybe three or four years ago is that that which everybody, that which everybody um, said uh, would happen if we withdrew was actually happening on the ground while we were plussing up. Um, uh, cleansing of sectarian cleansing, right. and this is again going to the point of actually having a thorough uh, debate of what 
what, what factors actually impact stability. So I, I go on, but I think it's a very serious option. Will it be uh, kind of discussed? Quite possibly, um, but I don't think it, it can be implemented in part because, as Aaron said, we are, we've got 100,000 troops there, and there's a certain, you have to s start from where, where you're at. But I think that it provides an interesting, I don't know, it's not even a glide path, but, and it's not quite a crash landing, but um, uh, I think Austin's paper is by far the most serious version of that. In particular, um, Austin has a great background in sort of the intelligence community and in special operations, and that's really what he's drawing on in terms of his research. Um, and then he answers this question that, that Jake brings up, which is how do you get the information to do the targeted killing, right? How do you, how do you, how do you get the intel in order to do that sort of high-value target campaign, right? So if you come out of a particular part of the coin community, what you're really looking for, and the reason why you focus on the population, is because the population knows, right? They know this is the good guy, this is the bad guy, and this is the guy who's been on the fence for six years, right? Um, that's why you focus on the population, because the population has all the intelligence. And you have to protect them in a way such that they will give that information to you and not to the other guys, right? That's the sort of redux version of counterinsurgency. Um, I think Austin is, is optimistic. I don't know if he's overly optimistic, but he's optimistic or at least sanguine that we will be able to do, as Jake sort of says, what we've done in Pakistan effectively, um, more, more or less the same in, in Afghanistan with a sort of overgrown Ranger Regiment and some helicopters in, in support. Um, I agree with Brian that I don't think it's going to dominate the debate, although I've tried to sort of push that paper out um, to the rest of the, you know, Coindinistas as, you know, this is, this is the best alternative, right? This is the best, you know, counterpunch to what it is we've advocated. And I think one of the interesting things, you know, if, if anybody's interested in the intellectual history of, you know, all of us up here, is that, you know, Austin is on the sort of coin side of the ledger fairly, fairly fully. We were in graduate school at the same time and spent too much time drinking beers in Boston together um, and both wrote dissertations on counterinsurgency or whatever um, as all of this was kind of unraveling here in, in, in Washington. And his you know, detailed, you know, sort of historical review is that, man, you just don't want to send 100,000 troops over there. Uh, he was opposed to the plus up uh, last fall. He didn't think it would be, not just didn't think it would be effective, didn't think it was a good idea and wasn't going to get us, you know, sort of the answers to the questions that, that Brian is asking. Um, I think that that's, you know, for, from my perspective, pretty telling both of his sort of intellectual integrity, but also that, uh, you know, the, the coin community more broadly is not monolithic and it's, you know, I'm a coin, you know, researcher or practitioner, and therefore I advocate large-scale counterinsurgency operations all the time. Um, and that's, I think, an important piece to note. But, um, you know, this is, this is a thought community here. You know, if you want people to debate that, make it so that people debate that. Get it on the table. And there are some human rights concerns to the second part of your question. Um, mm -hmm. And the human rights concerns include that the special forces in Afghanistan have been the absolute worst about civilian casualties and, and not recognizing them, not keeping track of them, and then of course not paying compensation and making other amends when they happen. And so they sort of exist in this fog of war intentionally. And so if we're going to go to a system where you've got special forces and drone attacks like in Pakistan, then we need to ask some fundamental questions about who is being targeted, who is actually a civilian and who isn't, because there's a lot of disagreement about that, even within the Pentagon and the CIA. Mm -hmm. Should the CIA be doing these kind of operations, as I assume they would in Afghanistan as well as in Pakistan? Um, <coughs> you know, so th there are some real questions about whether that would be better or not for the civilian population. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's, there's also just an important background to this debate, which is it's often taken as a given <coughs> that poorly governed spaces are useful for uh, transnational terrorist groups. And uh, I think that's basically wrong. Um, what you want is you want territory that's governed by someone who will tolerate and make your presence useful. So if you actually take a look at the internal correspondence of Al-Qaeda from when they were trying to set up uh, bases in Somalia, it was all about, gosh, what a pain in the butt this place is to work and how much it sucks. And we really need to go somewhere where there's a coherent government because we're getting ripped off by everyone left and right. Right. And what made Afghanistan useful for Al Qaeda from you know 1996 or seven uh, through the 9/11 attacks was that you had a government that offered the state up and its territory up under a great deal of control. Right, no uh, American president in the next 50 years is going to allow that to happen anywhere in the world again. Right, and so if the, the to to frame the debate in terms of kind of <laughs> Afghanistan now or Afghanistan pre the invasion in 2001 is false, 
Right? That's not the right comparison. Jake, I, I agree with you completely, though. Some would argue that that situation exists right now in North Waziristan. Um, in terms of, a, you know, there are Pakistani troops sitting in North Waziristan, right? There's toleration there, yeah? Uh, it hasn't proven very useful for them, right? I mean, the, the, the quality of the attacks that have come out of that area is, um, you know, very, very, very low. Pretty low. Yep. Brian, and if I could add, yeah. uh, when you compare North Waziristan today to North Waziristan 2004, 2006, I actually think we have a much more aggressive posture. It's not been recognized in our national security debate generally. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the drone strikes, but it is something very real is happening in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And people just talk about the drone strikes. Um, but it, it's really important that we get that right. Mm -hmm. And whereas we had a leader that was ceding territory that is hopefully will be taken back or is being there's there's pressure being applied there. Yeah. That was not the case uh, three or four years ago, and people we shouldn't forget that. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. I agree. Um, right here. Hi, my name is Serge Dust. I'm with the International Medical Corps, <coughs> which, along with many other uh, traditional NGOs, have been in uh, Afghanistan for more than 20 years. And I want to make a comment and uh, ask a question and use, uh, Aaron, your analogy of uh, writing songs uh, as a jumping <laughs> off point. Uh, I think, as we all agree, the quality of a song is not in how the person who wrote it sings it, but in how those who hear it uh, receive it. I think I'm a great singer, but no one agrees with me because <laughs> in their perspective, I'm not. And I think this is the fallacy of the coin strategy, or at least as you use in your analogy, uh, it may sound great in the mind of Petraeus or McChrystal how, how it's implemented, but what kind of research is done, and maybe it has, and how it's being interpreted in real life situations mm -hmm. by uh, Afghan civilians. And as part of the traditional NGO community, and the reason I say traditional NGO humanitarian development community, to differentiate ourselves from contractors who are taking money and spending it quite well and getting quite well rich about, about doing it, is that uh, the coin strategy has so uh, sabotaged our ability to work on behalf of the well-being of the Afghan people, which we've been doing for quite a long time. We consistently are being co-opted into being part of the coin, uh, the coin strategy to the point where USAID, which is, you know, uh, has written into its strategy that all NGO projects uh, must be part of the coin movement. In fact, the joke is that if you put coin in your project proposal at least three times, <laughs> you won't have to worry about not getting a grant. <laughs> uh, so could any of the panel uh, say something about uh, the role of you know, humanitarian development assistance as it's trying to work independently, but on, uh, with the U.S. military objectives and political, but as it tries to work on behalf of the Afghan people, and our ability to remain, to be seen as serving the people in Afghanistan is continually sabotaged by a coin strategy that seems to me not to have any regard for how Afghans interpret the coin strategy. Mm -hmm. I think you're certainly right, and I, I commiserate with your inability to sing. I'm also a very loud, bad singer, so that's don't ride in the car with me on the way home. Um, the uh, that's that is by I mean your inter, your sort of interpretation of USAID or military strategy is exactly right. Right, we sort of train you know train Marines to work with NGOs. Right, well, you know, U.S. military doesn't work with people in a cooperative, you know, sort of sort of way. They like to tell people what to do, and they like it when they do that, right? That's usually the way that work with works on the, on the military side. Um, I think, you know, in some ways, and, and I think Sarah will have a, a, maybe a different perspective a little bit, but, you know, you, you hope for a productive tension in a certain sense of, you know, there's going to be a baseline provision of security that's provided, so hopefully some NGOs can do part of that work. And I will respect that you, know, you are not uh, intelligence collectors for me, right? But that uh, if something sort of crosses uh, a very bright line that's sort of far down the road, you might be willing to re you know, share some of that information or your general uh, assessment of, of the area. Um, but it's, it's, it's very interesting for, uh, as kind of, um, I mean, 
pe people can be surprised. Military officers are, are idealists, and many of them are also, also romantics in a, in a very unusual sort of way. Uh, but they don't, and I've yet to really find one who, who sides with the NGO community on this, they don't hold to neutral humanitarian NGOs. They don't, because they don't believe there's, this is a neutral question, right? They're on the side of right, that's why they do what they do, and you should be on board for the big win, right? And that's, it's just a difference in fundamental approach and a sort of fundamental understanding of the mission. They're both very heartfelt. They're both based in a core set of beliefs. And sometimes there's just going to be that delta between the two communities. Um, Sarah Sewell's done a lot of work over the years to try to bring some senior folks in those communities uh, to, together. Uh, I think the relationships are, are better and there's a little bit more mutual understanding than there has been previously. But... I would aim for you know that that productive tension as opposed to outright hostility. Cause, but I'm not sure you're ever going to get them to be like, oh well, of course we understand that you have to you know provide medical care to wounded Taliban. Right? They're they're just never going to get there. Right? That's just not going to be part of their their calculus. Can I follow? Yes, quickly though. You know, we, we have we the NGO community have often said to U.S. military, European military, we won't take up guns and fight if you don't get involved in humanitarian projects. Right. <laughs> now, the, the problem is that the SERP, $1.2 billion of SERP, Commander's mm -hmm. Emergency Response uh, Program, uh, engages in the short impact yep. projects, which have absolutely no sustainability, mm -hmm. and leave the local population even more angrier than when, when the project was initiated. What good is building a school if there are no textbooks? Or, or if there are no teachers? So it's done without this you know, thoughtfulness that needs to take place. But yet it's done and creates and creates an even larger problem. Mm -hmm. right. And and that's what we're dealing with. And I won't mention SPOT. Anybody know what SPOT is? This tracking system where the DOD wants Afghan nationals that work for NGOs entered into the system, providing all the biometric data. This is another battle that we're just beginning right. to fight. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, how about up here? And let's actually go two questions and then to the panel. So here and then there. I'm Rob DeBaum, security advisor. Brian, we met two years ago this week in Balad. That's right. You yeah. and Joe Felter were out there doing some Hello. research stuff. Um, I have two questions, so I'll take both of them. Just kidding. <laughs> the first question is, can we all meet at Starbucks after this? Because this is a gigantic discussion. It's a, this is a watermelon. Uh, and each piece has essential value. The, the statistics on the board, the chart is like a soda straw jammed into a watermelon. You see some red, some white, some green. You may not get a seed. You may not get the raw part. You may not get the underripe part. You may not get the rotten part. Um, and the anecdotal stuff, Sarah, is uh, tremendously valuable. That's where I live. I'm not a math guy at all. In fact, I'm uh, struggling with a stats course right now. But, um, but the, that puts the flesh on the bones of the charts. But the charts themselves, the example is Helmand. It's a that gigantic spike of, of violence is completely disconnected from specific events of casualties uh, on the civilian population. We had all kinds of things going on. Uh, our surge was evident at that time. So the question is, um, how do we look at the whole watermelon? Uh, and it's a gigantic question and requires a Starbucks trip after this right down the road. Um, do we all see that? Do we all perceive and respect the fact that there's NGOs that feel vilified by the DOD and the DOD feel, I've been with them for 25 years, five as a contractor and 20 in the service. DOD sees the essential aspect of security, uh, providing security while the NGO is doing its thing. The NGO real, uh, needs to have the uh, hands off. We need to have a disconnect between uh, the, the, the stigma, the stigmatization of the, of the DOD, of the uh, NGO guys who uh, the local populace may think is all spies for the U.S. It's, it's a natural thing. So we got to look at the big picture, and the question is how. Okay, let's go here as well. We're going we're gonna to probably blow a little bit past 145. If you need to go, that's, that's fine. We've got the room for another few minutes. So, Hi, Matthew Ho. Um, get back to Brian's earlier question, the so what of this. Um, if there's any, and let's go back to Iraq and to Anbar and to 06, 07. I was there at the time. Um, we had very strict rules of engagement. We killed a lot of civilians, but we had very strict rules of engagement. So much so, I had a Marine one time get shot through his sh shoulder, return fire, and then was worried he was going to get in trouble for it. Mm -hmm. um, when, we get, when we got there in early fall '06, it was a mess. We had in my regiment's AO about 60 attacks against us a day. We didn't change our rules of engagement the entire time. And by the time we left in May, 
we are down to seven attacks a day in the AO. Um, is there any correlation, uh, getting back to the point of correlation and causation and a bigger picture of so what, is this kind of like WikiLeaks? Are we, we talking about a minor, a minor one-time event rather than talking about the big picture here and about actually what motivates uh, popular support for an insurgency? Because you said the, in the Sunni areas, the attacks were asymmetric, correct? So similar to in the Pashtun areas. So whether or not we're missing the larger point of this. Thoughts from the panel? Um, so, so, so two thoughts to try and tie, tie the two questions together. I think the first is one of the most powerful tools. So, so statistics are useful for some stuff and not for others. One of the things they're very useful for, and they're about the best tool human, the second best tool human beings have for identifying patterns in really noisy data. Right? The best tool is our eyes, but we're not always, we can't always represent everything in two dimensions. And so we use statistics, and it's very useful for identifying average effects, but that means it's always kind of wrong on the specifics in particular places. I think we want to be careful what we can take from it and what we can't. To, to, this ties into to the, the question about, you know, what, what are we missing here um, and what's different in different places. What you see in terms of the average response to different kinds of effects can give you information about what's going on behind the scenes. So there are multiple stories people tell about how the insurgents in uh, Afghanistan are motivating people to fight, mm -hmm. right, and how you're getting fighters. And so if you look at the patterns of civilian casualties, they're consistent with the kind of creation of these very localized grievances. Right? In other work that I've done with Brian, we've looked at the mobility of insurgents, doing a very simple thing, asking insurgents are, uh, when they're picked up by ISAF or Afghan forces, they're picked up in a particular place and they come from a particular place. And you can ask the very simple question of how many people are picked up in a different place than where they're from, right? So how much are fighters traveling? And it turns out the answer is they're almost never traveling, right? It's almost all being fought by people in local areas. So you put these two facts together and that tells you something very important about the insurgency, which is that it's not what you faced <laughs> Uh, perhaps in uh, Iraq or for sure in Vietnam, where you had mm -hmm. organized groups of insurgents moving around the country contesting control of territory. What instead you have is you have local grievances and local movements. That then should be informing the strategy. And I'll give you a very <coughs> practical example. If you think about where information operations resources should be located and how you should be trying to explain the conflict to Afghans, right? the implication is you shouldn't be worrying so much about the national level <coughs> stuff, but instead should be worrying district by district, how are we communicating with the people here? How do they understand the conflict? And it takes the emphasis away from the grand politics in Kabul and D.C., where, at least in the way it's discussed in the press, it is now to a much more local level. I just want to let, there's somebody in the back that's had their hand up the entire time. It's Jennifer, and this, this will have to be the last question, everyone. I'm sorry. Hopefully we can lock them in here for a little while, and you can ask questions afterwards. I'll be quick, uh, Brian, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Paul Eaton, National Security Network, and for context, a retired soldier. Uh, like most of us here, I'd like to comment on Brian Cotillo's uh, comment. Uh, what the military would like to see is uh, grand strategy. We do <laughs> tactical, operational, strategic planning. What's absent right now in, uh, in this country is the grand strategy to get after your question. And the second goes after uh, something I believe Aaron uh, brought up, and that was a uh, process change rendered by uh, General Corelli. How do you write rules of engagement when you're a 58-year-old infantry general who has a PhD and you've got to talk through all those uh, layers of command and control down to an 18-year-old, 40 years your junior, with a high school diploma? That is art. And what happened with General McChrystal when he put his ROE out was that you had company commanders who gave their platoon leaders instructions to avoid conflict. Don't go down into that part of the village because you will trigger a firefight. So the question, what is the art form? How do you do that to uh, help that 58-year-old general talk to the 18-year-old? And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a many-layered question there. I think that interpretation of the tactical directive is, is almost exactly right, that there was uh, the applied restrictions were very different than the actual stated restrictions. And 
you know, where where the reality actually was uh, is is a challenge. I mean, there's a commander's intent that's issued, but then it's left up to much more junior soldiers and Marines to, to interpret. And one difference we haven't talked about in Iraq and Afghanistan is that the coalition environment in Afghanistan makes everything 15 times as hard. So you issue that, and now it's going to get interpreted by British soldiers who grew up with different doctrine. It's going to grow up by with, you know, with Aussie soldiers, diggers, who have no doctrine. It's going to be read by French, Italian, Poles, Lithuanians, Macedonians, Greeks, South Koreans. Good God, right? The simple question of how you get the 18-year-old American to understand the 52-year-old American's uh, intent is almost easy by by comparison. I wondered, Sarah, if you have a good... Yeah, I mean, I would say that the art is in training. It all goes back to training. Everyone, everyone who is going to be deployed in Afghanistan, whether they're military or civilian, needs way more training than they're getting before they get deployed. I mean, you have to go through escalation of force incidents training a million times before you know what to do in those four to seven seconds that you have to figure out if that's a real or a perceived threat. I know that I wouldn't be able to do it, and I'm looking out for the best interests of the civilians, and I still wouldn't know whether to fire or not. And you have to go through it over and over and over again, and that's where the guidance gets down to the 18-year-old, and you say, here's why it's in your best interest and in the best interest of all of your buddies to do it this way. And you have to figure out what that best interest is. And you have to figure out what it is for the UK and France and South Korea. And this is the time that we are not taking, is to translate that to the 18-year-old. Make sure they understand it. Make sure they understand why it's going to protect them, the mission, their buddies, and then train them on it over and over again. If I could, in conclusion, I mean, on the grand strategy and then also the two points about the big picture, the gentleman down front and Matt, uh, and all of you, thank you for your service. Uh, we're all struggling with that, and I think one way is to uh, keep our eyes open for more data points, and that's why when I, uh, this is why I, t I talked in the way that I did when I read this paper, because it's great, but there are so many data points that could be included in this, and the problem then from a quantitative standpoint is then how do you uh, ensure that your model does not become overdetermined and you have all sorts of uh, effects that interact with uh, one another, which is why I think it's really hard for us as a country to do because even we get into these balkanized debates uh, about, uh, largely about tactics. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I, I think that's an important point that General Eaton, you make at every public forum I speak at, and I'm glad, you, I'm glad you do that. But, you know, the national security strategy as released at the end of May by the Obama administration, and I was largely supportive of it, but it, it, it didn't actually spark a strategic debate. I mean, the only debate it actually sparked was among conservatives who couldn't decide whether to accuse Obama of plagiarism or treason. Um, <laughs> um, but it didn't actually provide guidance in the way that broader strategic framework, and that's what I'm saying is that I, I, with full respect and appreciation for the attention to detail and how we do things and the point Serge brought up, uh, which I think is a very important point of how do we make sure we're not over-militarizing development assistance and does COIN actually lead to unsustainable outcomes in certain places, which I think we actually see in Iraq right now. Um, but taking a step back to that bigger picture, it's really hard to do because it gets uh, wrapped up in our political debates and political positioning. But a big part of it is understanding and listening to what the local population uh, has to say. And then also remembering, and this is so hard for us to do, which is it's not all about us. Mm. Um, actually, others actually have a strategic stake and interest. And, and I think those sorts of general guidance issues, it's hard because when you get into national security debates and the full range of what goes on in D.C., it's really hard to get to that, that, that ideal truth or the platonic truth. So. Okay, well, let me uh, please join me in giving them a hand. This was really great. Um, thank you very much for coming, and uh, we'll do more of